Let's please welcome Dr. Alan Bowling. Great. Thank you. When I was asked to do this program, I was told that there would be uh, people with uh, MS attending the program, also their uh, relatives and friends potentially, and also some uh, MS healthcare providers. So that's that's a pretty broad uh, audience to uh, cover. Often I I do programs more for people who have MS or uh, MS health professionals. So in the talk today, this is a little different uh, kind of talk for me. I've really tried to uh, cover a broad uh, territory in a pretty short period of time. Uh, and it was kind of exciting for me to put this talk together. This is a little different than any uh, talk I've done previously. And I've done many uh, different types of programs in this uh, area. So um, I'm trying to cover uh, lots of different bases. And you'll see there's a little, there's some overlap in what I talk about and a little different, uh, different perspectives on some of the, uh, the same uh, topic areas. And I'm, uh, I'm based at the Rocky Mountain MS Center, which is south of Denver in Englewood, uh, Colorado. We're a, a multidisciplinary MS center. Uh, within the center, uh, about eight years ago, I started a complementary and alternative medicine program. The information you're going to hear today was largely developed through uh, that program. Next slide, please. And like I say, in the program today, I'm going to cover lots of, uh, lots of territory in a fairly short period of time, and then we should have uh, quite a bit of time for questions after to cover uh, additional areas. So I'm going to give some uh, general background information, just kind of define what it is we're going to talk about in terms of alternative medicine. Also give kind of background information about who uh, tends to use unconventional medicine. And then the real core of what I'm going to talk about today are... Uh, MS relevant alternative or unconventional therapies. And then the other core piece of what I'm going to talk about is uh, what I refer to as integrative MS care, and that's going to be presented in the five different steps. So those, uh, the second and third bullet points there, those really are the, the two main things I'm going to uh, talk about. And you'll see it will kind of be a real uh, change of gears there, but uh, it's really interesting to see. We're going to be talking about the same kinds of things, but uh, the first part's going to be a little more theoretical and integrative care. That's going to be quite uh, practical, and that really is uh, directed towards people who have MS, give you uh, some take-home uh, practical uh, advice. And then at the end, I'll give some uh, brief uh, direction towards information resources and talk about future directions in terms of the area of uh, unconventional medicine. Next slide, please. So I'd like to start with this uh, cartoon. I'm not sure if you have this cartoon in Australia. This is quite popular in uh, the United States. This is a cartoon called Kathy. I took the liberty to take out a few panels, but she's looking for some vitamin C. She goes to the store looking for vitamin C. She finds vitamin C with echinacea, with rose hips, time release C, C with bioflavonoids, and then the panels I took out, she found lots of other vitamin C products, and then she says, get me out of here, option overload. I can't think, I can't breathe. And she goes that back to work, and someone says, you look terrible, Kathy. You should start taking some vitamins. So I like this slide, because I like this cartoon, because I think it captures a lot of what uh, happens for many people who are interested in some kind of unconventional therapy. You have a particular, you may have a particular question you go out and try to get an answer to the question. It takes a lot of time. Uh, it can very, be very frustrating. And after you've put all this time and resources into getting an answer to the question, often you still don't have an answer to the question. So my hope in the talk today is to answer some of your questions and give you guidance on how to answer future questions that you might have in this area, especially uh, MS-relevant questions. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So before we get going too far, let's just d define what it is we're talking about. So uh, the broadest term that's used in this area is unconventional medicine. Uh, and some of the early work that was done in this area was done by uh, an American uh, researcher, Dr. David Eisenberg. And the uh, definition used in his early papers was medical therapy that is not widely taught at medical schools or is not generally available in hospitals. That's a little bit of an odd definition because it says what 
the therapy isn't as opposed to what it is, but I think it conveys, it still generally conveys what, uh, I think most people get a sense for what that uh, means. Uh, in the United States, at least, that, uh, that definition is a little bit of a moving target also because most American medical schools now at least have limited curriculum in uh, unconventional medical therapies. Uh, this, uh, the next definition is a patient's definition. Those therapies which I had to pay for out of pocket and never felt comfortable discussing with my physicians. So I think uh, that definition also conveys the, the types of therapies that we're uh, referring to. Next slide, please. And then the uh, term that's used at least uh, most frequently in the United States and uh, often among uh, professionals is complementary and alternative medicine, and you'll see that used on my slides uh, frequently, and that's, uh, that refers broadly to unconventional medicine. It refers to the way unconventional therapies are used. So complementary medicine means unconventional therapies are used in addition to conventional medicine. The next slide. Alternative medicine means unconventional therapies are used instead of conventional medicine. The next slide. And then CAM, or complementary and alternative medicine, that's just the broader umbrella term of uh, the uh, use of unconventional therapies either in addition to or instead of conventional medicine. Next slide. Now, uh, this is just kind of an arbitrary uh, plot that I've uh, come up with, and it's a real kind of stereotyped view of conventional medicine and unconventional medicine, and it's kind of a black and white view of uh, these two approaches. And on the uh, x-axis there, you can see the uh, level of evidence that, that we have for the effectiveness and safety of a particular therapy. And then this stereotype view with conventional medicine, we have a very high level of evidence for safety and effectiveness. For unconventional medicine, we have very little or no evidence for safety and effectiveness. Now, this is how some, uh, it's not used very, actually, go back a slide there. So uh, this is really a black and white view. This, real, this is how, uh, it's not done too frequently now, but uh, sometimes this is how conventional medicine and unconventional medicine are defined, basically that conventional medical therapies are proven, unconventional therapies are uh, unproven. That really is an incorrect definition. I can tell you as someone who is uh, extremely involved in practicing uh, conventional medicine, I try as hard as I can to be at the very highest level of evidence in terms of safety and effectiveness. I try to be in that very highest uh, oval there, but uh, many, many times during a day of practice, I dip down into a gray zone. Next slide. A gray zone uh, where the level of evidence is not uh, perfect, and that's uh, just trying to do the best we can with the conventional therapies that we have. So I think that's a much uh, more honest view of uh, what we do on the conventional side. And it really is. We're just we're just trying to do the best we can with uh, the therapies that we have, and. We don't have perfect evidence for all of those therapies. Similarly, on the unconventional side, there are totally wacko therapies. There are things that are totally ridiculous. They are uh, proven to be you know, ineffective or they're very unsafe, and those are in that uh, black uh, oval there. But, the next slide, there are some unconventional therapies that do go into this uh, gray zone. And that's, uh, that's the challenging area, these unconventional therapies that are in the, in the gray zone. How do you uh, differentiate those? So I think this is a more honest view of uh, the world. In this gray zone area with conventional medicine and unconventional medicine, that can be a tricky area to try to enter into. Next slide. If you try to get into that area and try to get some answers to questions, often instead of getting objective information, you end up just hearing about the uh, amazing uh, conflict between those on the conventional side and those on the unconventional side. And obviously what I'm, uh, what I'm presenting here is the, uh, the American view of the whole situation. So it might be interesting at the end to hear uh, if uh, what I'm presenting in terms of the conflicts and some prejudices, if those are uh, true on the uh, Australian side uh, as well. So, 
Uh, I started out kind of leading definitions of uh, conventional and unconventional medicine into this uh, uh, description of uh, conflicts that uh, occur in conventional and unconventional medicine. I'm going to use this same uh, figure later on in the talk when we I try to give some uh, practical advice in terms of conventional medicine and unconventional medicine. So we're going to leave this uh, picture now, but uh, keep it in your mind because we're going to come back to it. So next slide. So in terms of uh, unconventional medicine use, there have been uh, many different uh, studies. Uh, these are uh, North American studies, and it's uh, hard to uh, compare study to study because often unconventional medicine is defined in different ways. Uh, but uh, this is an attempt that I've made to use uh, similar definitions of unconventional medicine uh, in terms of uh, excluding prayer and exercise and defining unconventional medicine as uh, whether people ever have used it during their lifetime. And the top bar is a study done of just the general population. And then the bottom four bars are North American studies of people with MS. So you can see that uh, by these uh, parameters, unconventional medicine use appears to be uh, similar or somewhat higher among people with MS. Next slide. And then there have been uh, studies in uh, other countries, European countries. There was a study published in International Journal of MS Care, a study done uh, in Australia, reported in 2001, showing that uh, more than three-fourths of people uh, with MS in Australia uh, had used some form of unconventional therapy. So this is not uh, many of the uh, early studies in this area uh, were uh, uh, done in the United States, many epidemiological studies, uh, but then uh, there have been other, uh, there have been European studies and uh, Australian studies showing quite similar numbers in terms of uh, people with MS and also uh, the general population. Next slide. So now what I want to do is uh, talk about, this is one of the two kind of core areas of the talk, and what I want to do is uh, focus on uh, some particular types of uh, unconventional therapies. And I want to uh, talk about those in terms of uh, the type of effects that they might have. And when we talk about MS therapies, the two broad types of therape therapeutic effects uh, that agents can have is uh, that they can uh, modify the underlying disease process, and that's called the disease modifying effect, or they can treat the symptoms that are caused by the disease. And those sim that symptoms might be fatigue or weakness or walking difficulties. So there are disease-modifying effects to treat the underlying disease, and there are symptomatic effects. So that's often how we think about conventional therapies, and that's how I'm going to talk about uh, some of the unconventional therapies. There are a huge number of unconventional therapies that we could cover. I'm just going to focus on some where we have uh, some evidence or there's some interesting uh, observations. So in terms of a disease-modifying effect, I'm going to focus on two areas, polyunsaturated fatty acids and antioxidants. Next slide. In terms of polyunsaturated fatty acids, let's, I'll just give you a little primer in terms of fats, and many of you uh, may be quite familiar with this, but uh, fats come in two basic forms. There are saturated fats, like you might find in butter or lard, and then there are unsaturated fats, which come in a monounsaturated form, such as olive oil, <clears throat> and then there are the polyunsaturated fats, which are often abbreviated PUFAs for polyunsaturated fatty acids, and then two primary forms of those are omega-3 fatty acids, like you might find in fish oil, and omega-6 fatty acids like you might find in sunflower seed oil or safflower seed oil. Next slide. <clears throat> For those of you who have tried to explore the area of uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids in MS, it is uh, incredibly uh, confusing. It's incredibly controversial. Uh, it took me many, many months of kind of sifting through all the various studies talking to people who had actually done some of the studies to really get a, a sense for uh, what I thought was a, a reasonable approach to this area. Often you find a very biased opinion, like diet has nothing to do with MS or diet's the cure for the MS, cure for MS. I think the, the truth is somewhere in between. I'm going to kind of summarize many, many scientific and clinical studies in a couple of tables just to uh, convey 
uh, why there's such a controversy in, in this area, and I'm going to present the information in a way that uh, shows why uh, you can present this in a very positive or a very negative way. So in terms of really basic scientific studies, there are immunological studies where uh, especially omega-3 fatty acids like fish oils, they do appear to be mildly suppress the immune system. And so for a disease like MS where the immune system is too active, that could be helpful uh, for a disease like MS. The concern is that that really is just scientific evidence. It's not uh, clinical trial evidence. The next level of evidence is an animal model called EAE, and that really is just uh, uh, in, uh, in the animal model, especially with the omega-6 fatty acids, the disease is less severe if you give the animals extra omega-6 fatty acids, but the animal model is not perfect, and that's not a human clinical study. Uh, next thing closer to the human disease is epidemiological studies where you look at big populations, and if you do that, there have been several studies showing the populations that take in more polyunsaturated fatty acids tend to have a lower uh, prevalence of MS. Uh, but once again, that's not a human clinical trial. That's not the most rigorous uh, data that we can obtain. Next slide. So the better evidence is to do clinical trials where you take a group of people with MS and you give one group a placebo and you give another group an active treatment and then you watch those people over time and there are very rigorous criteria uh, and parameters in terms of how you divide the people up and how you monitor them and you make sure that people don't know they're receiving particular treatments. Uh, so the very formal uh, clinical trial uh, criteria that have been established over the years. So that's really the gold standard on how to establish whether a therapy works. So in terms of studies that have been done in this area, there are some older studies done by Dr. Roy Swank. Many of you may be familiar with the Swank diet. He really started his studies uh, back in the 1940s, 1950s, before this, the rigorous clinical trial uh, criteria had been uh, definitively established. So he actually didn't have a placebo-treated group. His study did show some impressive results, but not having a placebo-treated group is a, a significant uh, deficiency. There were some studies done in the, 19, late in the 1970s looking at omega-6 supplements in the form of sunflower seed oil. Two of the three of those studies showed some beneficial effects in terms of attack severity, but one of those studies uh, was negative. So there is concern with regarding the one negative study. And then in terms of omega-3 supplements, there are uh, two studies that showed what's referred to as a trend, but it, they were not statistically significant. So if you kind of look at all this information, like I say, this is a uh, I think a, a nice way to kind of summarize many, many different studies. And you can see how if you focus on the positive results, you can make a very positive argument, or you focus just on the negative concerns, you can uh, make a negative argument. I think the uh, truth is somewhere in between and some kind of practical translation of this for people who have MS. I'll make, uh, I'll make that practical translation later uh, in the program. Next slide. So uh, another area where that might have a disease-modifying effect are antioxidants. And, uh